basically these companies are about to get their ass whooped like my dogs. But um, you're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong. Welcome to episode 185 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. I'm Dave Roberts. With me is my podcast partner in crime, writer, journalist, owner of the Georgia Virtue, and dog mom, Jessica Salaji. Hey, Dave. How was your week? My week was, it was actually good. Um, We had cooler weather down here in South Georgia. Yeah, same thing. Um... that storm came through, uh, which oddly enough was it hit New Orleans uh, on the 16th anniversary to the day of when Katrina hit. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, of course, I you know I, I it's very close to 16 years since I last deployed because I, I was there. Uh, but yeah, it brought in cooler weather, and that's not exactly good for my business. You know, when you had the last week of August, uh, first couple of days of September, and the high is like 75, 78. It'll be back though. I mean, it, it's a it's a false fall. I've got everybody on, on my Facebook stream talking about pumpkin spice lattes and and sweaters and stuff. I'm like, no, it ain't over. Well, also, are you a pumpkin spice person? No, I'm I'm not either. And I think apple cider or just apple flavor is like the premier fall flavor, anyway. Now I make an apple pie moonshine that's outstanding. Yeah. I like apple pie anything. I've never had apple pie moonshine, but I can bet it's better than pumpkin spice moonshine. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, and after I make it, uh, because it, it you cook apples, and uh, uh, the whole house smells like cinnamon apple. I mean, the whole house smells awesome when I'm making it. And, of course, I make a non-alcoholic version of just cider for, for, for the kids. Plus, what's left over... The, the apples that are left over, I make an applesauce for, for, for my nephews who are now eight, but it, it's some of the best applesauce you ever have. You put the alcohol, obviously, at the end because you don't cook alcohol because it would just cook off. You but said it's, domestic, Dave. Man, I like to cook. Yeah. I'm fat. I like to eat. Therefore, I like to cook. Yeah. Well, they say but you're yeah, not that, supposed to trust a skinny chef. Well, that this is true. Although, I, I, I am getting skinnier by the day, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm far from skinny, but yeah, I, 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 I like to cook, but they, yeah, the house just smells awesome. I do it around Thanksgiving and it just, it really sets off the season when, you know, the whole house smells like apple and, and, uh, and cinnamon, oh. but yeah, it's not exactly great for business, but you know, it, it was, I had to, I had a lot of paperwork to catch up on, you know, when you've got invoices that haven't gone out in a month because I don't have an office person and I have to actually have a chance to sit down, breathe and hack out some, some invoices that that's a good thing because invoices equal, you know, getting paid. Sure. They're imperative to survival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially, especially when your wife yells at you because you, because you haven't gotten them out. Oh. I actually ran into a, a friend of mine, but he, he listens to the show, and he, and, uh, he was talking about it. We were at a, an event Tuesday night, and he was uh, uh, saying, man, whenever I listen to it, you are the one of the few people that sounds the same on the radio as in person. I wouldn't even know if that's true. No, you wouldn't. Uh, you talked to me on the phone. Sure. Uh, so I said, well, you know, the, the person I am on the, on the podcast is a character. He goes, no, it's an exaggeration of your actual personality. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, thanks. That sounds accurate also. <laughs> I concur. So we have an update from last week's show. We do. So last week we talked about the vaccine incentives that the city of Statesboro was going to offer, and they had a bunch of different tiers of them, um, and they had their first – I mean, obviously, we've had plenty of vaccine clinics down here, but the city of Statesboro had their first vaccine clinic that included incentives. And um, if you recall, I'm, I talked about the city council meeting where they were just, you know, thinking they were going to have people lined about the door and they were going to run out of cards, but they would have the medical personnel stick stick around so that they could pass out all those gift cards. And as it turns out, they were prepared to offer 
200 gift cards and only 68 people showed up and they stayed an extra two hours and still didn't even get a hundred. And, you know, like I've said on the show, if you want to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you don't, that's your business. I don't really care. But I think incentives are completely um, improper. And I'm glad that it was a f- that that part was a failure, even though now we just have to worry about, you know, city officials putting those gift cards in their pocket. But whatever. Now, look, if a private organization wants to do a vaccination pu- a push, that's fine. Just like the gun buybacks, we typically buy private organizations, which I love gun buybacks because I'm the guy that's outside the buyback with a sign that says I pay more. Mm-hmm. And I have done it and did and did pretty well. Picked up some very nice antique pistols that were headed for the smelt. And these things were 100-year-old revolvers. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll give you, I'll, they're going to give you 25, I'll give you 50 for each. Here's 100 bucks. And people say, yeah? yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. Uh, uh, cash money versus a gift card? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they did. It was cold that day, too. It was Martin Luther King weekend. It was so, it was cold. Uh, but yeah, we, we stood out there. There was a hundred of us or so with, with signs. And we just, as people went went by, we, we checked out what they had. But anyway, that's not part of the, st- the story. But yeah, the, the fact is, people aren't going to be bought. If you don't want a vaccine, I don't, you're not going to be bought off. You don't well, want it. And, you know, the, sure, there are plenty of people who will line up for anything free. I mean, we, we see that all the time, but $50 is not going to tip the scales for, you know, it's not going to change anybody's mind. And, you know, the, the mayor posted, I, I posted that they had a, a poor turnout and the, it, there was an article about it in the newspaper. And so of course the mayor responded and put a post on his Facebook about how we had 68 people in the, or 63 people in the ICU and all of them were unvaccinated and the cost that it take to take care of them. And he'll hand out $50 gift cards um, any day of the week. And Eric and I were talking about it. You know, first of all, that's super easy to say when it's not your money. But second of all, you know, that relies on the fact that it would it would have to require all 63 of those people to be uninsured so that we are somehow on the hook for them and again i understand that this is costly and and the care of somebody being uninsured or on medicare or even just working for you know the the city or county government and us being cuz we pay for their healthcare plans but if if they're so passionate about this, why aren't these elected officials standing out front with their own checkbook saying, I'll write you a check for 50 bucks if you get vaccinated? Right. And look, if if you decide not to get vaccinated, it's your business. It doesn't it doesn't affect me at all. Uh I if someone believes it's it's bad for their health or what whatever it is. Whatever reason that you have, it's bad for your health, you're allergic to uh, eggs or whatever, you know, because usually these vaccines are cooked in eggs. Um, whatever, whatever reason you have, $50 is not going to change it. Are you going to risk a uh, an allergic reaction for 50 bucks? That I hope not. No, you're not. You're, you're just not. But I, I would guess the 65 people, who, whoever, whatever number it was... We're planning on getting vaccinated anyway. Like, ah, this is good, good enough time. Yeah, it's all like well, I said. It's already right. at no cost to the end end user, except on our taxes. So I don't, I I don't see people getting off their butts for a chance to win win a uh, uh, an Xbox or fifty dollar gift card or or whatever else. I mean, it's not like they're sitting at home going, I don't I don't trust this vaccine. Ooh, fifty dollars. Well, and so I was reading this article last week, too, that it was saying that at least 15 million doses of various COVID vaccines from different um, pharmaceutical companies had been thrown out in the United States alone since March. And um, it was really fascinating. I mean, obviously, I was like, I clicked the headline because I was absolutely enraged. Like, what the heck are we doing? And I thought it all had to do with temperature stuff because, you know, the mRNA stuff has to be... um, kept at a certain temperature, blah, blah, blah. But in those little glass 
I guess it's a vial is what you would call it. I'm not sure. But with the little bottle that it comes in, there's multiple doses in there. And once they puncture it, some of them can only last for eight hours. Some of them can last 12 hours. So when the city started, you know, the city by default wasted vaccines by opening them and getting them started. And then when people don't come. So, I mean, it, it's just a cluster all the way around. And it just shows that government should not be doing these types of things because government cannot do it efficiently. Like the private sector is having a difficult enough time doing it. And all those, all these doses that are, you know, that were thrown out and are thrown out every single day of the week all around the country, we still pay the pharmaceutical companies for. The pharmaceutical oh, sure. company isn't going to say, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry you didn't get to use three out of six of the doses in the thing. Here's your money back. Right. So anyway, yeah, it might have caught $50 in gift cards, but the cost, I mean, you had people sitting out there from the Department of Health. You had city employees staying out there with their thumb out in the wind and... You know, of course, it was a photo op. They paid for a banner in the front yard. Like, these costs add up. It was not just $50 a person. Right. Well, anything that the private sector can do, government can do worse. Yes. It doesn't matter what it is. With the outside of the military, anything that that, that uh, the private sector can do, government can do much, much worse. So, speaking of worse, hey, hey, ho, ho, Jackie Johnson got to go. Yes! What wonderful news. And I hope Eric so, plays the audio from the from the video with I my really favorite hate, song. I, I hate that statement. I don't. It's this little kid. Have you seen the video? Yeah, I have. There's no verb in there. Got. <laughs> she got has to. got to go. No. She anyway. Got to go. I, I hate You, you that. can't chant has got to go that would, i mean if you're gonna do that you might as well be like hey hey ho ho jackie johnson really needs to leave like are we, it's a chant dave have you never <laughs> protested before uh as a kid well this is a kid was your grammar perfect wasn't awful anyway <laughs> Jackie so Johnson. former Brunswick uh, Judicial Circuit District Attorney Jackie Johnson has been indicted by a Glen County grand jury. Yes. Okay, so last Thursday, I was at home working, and my phone rang, and I was in the middle of something, and it was my friend who is an attorney, and I, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to let it go because, you know, I'm in the middle of the work day. I don't need to be talking. You call me back. I'm like, okay. So... Uh, I said I would call her back. So she she sends me a text that's like nine one one. Call me immediately. So I call her and she's and right when I was like waiting for her to answer the phone, somebody texted me and was like Jackie Johnson was invite indicted. And my friend answered the phone and she lives in Glen County and she was like Jackie Johnson was indicted. It's not for like any of the things that we wanted to be and it's certainly not enough. But I'm so excited. And then there was lots of cheering and yelling and excitement and i was like you know when is she well, getting booked when is she getting her mug shot <sighs> yeah she's charged with violation of oath of public officer mm-hmm. and obstruction of a police officer yes so both of them are with regard to this shooting death of ahmaud arbery which you know this just shows how i'm very excited about this because i think she did handle the case poorly no doubt. And she did some very unethical and obviously illegal things. However, it just shows that, um, Chris Carr doesn't actually have a backbone. He just has somebody propping him up and it's someone probably who is a campaign consultant because in doing this, he's going for one specific demographic, um, in trying to earn votes. They presented to the grand jury for three months in, June, July, and then August, and they presented a number of cases, and this was all they could muster. And I'm telling you, as somebody, like, I investigated Jackie Johnson far more than Chris Carr's office ever did, and there's there's a mile-long list of things you could indict her and her previous subordinates for, but I'll take what I can get, because she has sent 
two people to prison that we know of for violation of oath of a public officer with no underlying charge. So, you know, the chickens, they're all roosting right now as they're on their way home. Freaking Jackie. Well, the violation of oath of public officer is a felony that carries one to five years. Yes. Uh, obstruction and hindering of law enforcement is a misdemeanor. So that's 12 months or less. Yes. If she's if she's actually convicted. Yes. I don't think that Chris Carr would, would send his office if they didn't think that they they had the ability to to convict. Mm, Do you think she I actually goes Chris, to prison? I don't think Chris Carr knows what it takes to convict somebody because prior to becoming attorney general, he'd never been in a courtroom before. So um I I his judgment means nothing to me and and you know, whatever. But um, do I think she gets, did, was the question, do I think she gets convicted or I think she goes to prison? Do you think she goes to prison? I don't think she'll spend a day in prison, which, you know, if I'm being principled, I, I agree with. Like there was not a, um, I'm not sure she should be in prison right now. I, I don't, I don't know that I would advocate for that for somebody else. Um, I think she should have to surrender her bar license. I, if she's convicted, I think she should be on probation for the longest amount of time she sh- um, could. I would love for her to be, I don't think she should get first offender. I think she should lose her right to vote um, and do all the things she did to other people. Like, you know, when it had nothing to do with violence or gangs and she made them, you know, sign away their fourth amendment rights and, and the, and under Rico and stuff like that, like, and and if she's in cer- certain gatherings, she's sh- violating her probation. Like, I, I think she should be held to the same standards she ruined other people's lives for. Um, but do I think she will go to prison? No. Do I think she should go to prison? I would love to see her in prison, but I'm not sure it's appropriate for these crimes. I don't understand how they didn't get her on. You present for three months and you get two charges. Well... Yeah, I mean, I, how bad was the presentation? I mean, it, you, she didn't. She doesn't get a chance to argue in front of the grand jury. Yes. So she, yes, she does. Did she? I think. So, maybe I'm not it, sure. No, she doesn't. The, yeah, no, it, it. You hear one side of the story, and you hear witnesses and, and everything else. So, it it goes back to you can indict a ham sandwich. So, there's a whole list of things she could have been charged with. Uh, I, I agree with you. She should be absolutely disbarred. She should never practice law ever again. Uh, she should be held as a felon. The, the only reason that I I would like to see her do at, at least some time in prison is it is to, is an example to the rest of them. And I agree, a hundred percent. It's just like, not and not just not just attorneys. Uh, any public official needs to look at that and go, ooh. Yeah, let's not do that. No, I, I don't disagree with that. It's just it's just hard for me to advocate for that because I wouldn't I don't think that if somebody else did it, they should spend time in prison for it either. And so you know Yeah, justice is blind. Uh so the fact that she that what an awful person she is should not come into uh come into the courtroom. That, you know, it everything should be on the facts of the case. And is she a danger to the public? No. And in the, in the COVID era where people are in prison and getting sick and dying and the Department of Corrections isn't really doing anything because they don't really, like, care about the people that are incarcerated. I'm not, like, as terrible a person as I think she is, like, I don't think we should just be putting more people in our prison for any reason, but for that reason as well, I just yeah, and it's it, yeah, it it, it it do nothing but cost us money to house her and, and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I just, at least I, with you know, probation, she has to pay her own fees. I think she should have to pay restitution. I think she should. I I I wish that it was okay to um like if she was convicted, she had to pay for you know the cost of having the attorney generals come down and investigate and the cost for the grand jurors to be there those days because they called them out, I think two or three days a month for those, um, you know, like things like that. Like she should have to pay back taxpayers, but it won't happen. And 
she no. has retirement like Dick Donovan and um she's one of many, but no matter what happens, if she's convicted on any of the charges, that that will be I mean, I will be pleased. And and of course you can find the complete story on the Georgia Virtue and the you are awesome at pick, picking out pictures. That that is the perfect picture of her. Well, that that's on that story. Unfortunately, even as record of recording, um, she had not been booked. Um, but you can check the George Virtue for her mugshot because it'll be on there too. Right. So Marietta Council drops bow and arrow hunting issue. Uh, Councilman Johnny Walker, which is awesome, named after Scotch, mm-hmm. uh, brought the issue forward in July because reports that bow hunters had shot an injured deer in the city. Uh, residents apparently complained about how bow hunters uh, entering their backyards injured deer stumbling across roads and similar scenes. Huh. It's almost like when you shoot something, it hurts. Well, it's not kind. I understand that, but... Um... It, Nature it does, isn't kind. No, but uh, it, it makes me laugh thinking about, like, they make it sound like it was, like, something out of a movie, like, just bloody deer just all over the city of Marietta. <laughs> I, I just don't think it's like that. I, I just envision East Cobb, like, in this, you know, apocalypse-style deer era. Yeah, but but you know, the same residents are going to complain when they they're hitting deer because the population explode. Deer populations have exploded in the suburbs. They're not out in the woods. They've they've become suburbanites. There's plenty of food. It's safe. We have enough green space uh, around Georgia that we have suburban deer. Uh, the new proposed ordinance uh, would have mandated nobody could fire a crossbow, bow and arrow, or other archery device toward a person, building, or vehicle. It also uh, would have prohibited uh, shooting them at random on along across a public right of way. Okay, but we know why people went to the bow and arrow, right? Yeah, you can't shoot a gun. You can't shoot a gun in in just about every municipality in the state, so. Every city. That's that's what I said. Municipality. Yeah, it, yeah, you can you can certainly do it in the in the county. Right. Right. So it's <laughs> it's already <laughs> illegal to shoot an arrow at a person or a vehicle or across a roadway, uh, across across land that you're not you don't have permission to hunt. It's already illegal. This, this ordinance doesn't do anything. You can't shoot across a right-of-way. You can't shoot across a roadway. You can't shoot towards towards a house or a person. No, it's DNR already illegal. Is pretty, they're pretty strict, too. Right. Yeah, it, 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 and as far as going in their backyards, you have two, th- two things going on there. Now, if someone's hunting in your backyard, that's poaching. That's not hunting. It's illegal and, for and, them to be there. They're yeah, poaching. They're but if they're, they're doing all kinds of things. But if, if someone is giving fair chase to an animal, what do you want? Do you, do, are you upset because the deer's injured? Well, that's what the hunter's doing is tracking the deer down to dispatch it and, and obviously harvest the, harvest the meat. So I don't, I, I don't really understand what they want. Now, truthfully... If you're going to go on somebody's property, you, you are supposed to go knock on the door, say, excuse me, uh, uh, I'm tracking an animal that I shot. Do you, mind if I, do, you mind, do you mind if I cross your property? In a neighborhood, that's really impractical because you're only talking about quarter acre, half acre lots. So it's not like you, you shoot an animal and it runs onto an 80 acre farm and then you go to the farmhouse, knock on the door, say, hey, listen, I'm trying to track a deer. I'm not hunting on your property. Uh, do you mind? And 90% of people are like, hey, no problem. I don't want you hunting my property, but go ahead and get the animal that that, that you shot. It it, ha- it, hap- it happens all the time. Um, I don't understand what this ordinance does, other than it's it's a feel good ordinance. 
But deer population has to be kept in check. Or well, else they're getting hit by cars, uh, something like that. And they yeah. ultimately voted to table it and not, or they took no action. And um, there were some conversations during one of the committee hearings on it about like, you're not, you're not, like, you're just slowing down an action. You're not going, I mean, people are going to, you can point, a, I don't know, but they, they, they were on the right track, I guess. But what, what was interesting to me is that Johnny Walker promoted the, or um, presented this and then the fall, like they asked staff to prepare the ordinance and they were going to discuss it at the next meeting and he wasn't, he didn't join them by Zoom and he wasn't present. And so um, he wasn't even there to, like he, he had staff waste their time and I don't know. But one councilwoman, this is the lady that I was going to mention because she for once, a, a local government official had something on the right track, but she said, it's Michelle Cooper Kelly. She said, we have had one one offs every now and again, but we're moving rights that currently exist when we're not really having breaches or issues that are coming out. It just concerns me. I mean, at a least stupid she, at least, statement. it is, but at least she recognized that like you're talking about one or two people. You want to make an entirely new ordinance over something that's already illegal, can already be addressed by other local and state statutes. And that, like, <sighs> it, it comes down to people don't like hunters, you know, especially East Cobb, where the the demo is changing. You got a lot of people moving up from Buckhead and stuff. You've got a, a lot of a lot of uh, folks that are maybe a little <clears throat> a little more sensitive to the subject of hunting that just don't like it in general. Uh, you know, why can't you just go and get meat at the grocery store like everybody else? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, because it's so kind, con- you know, cows are treated so kindly before mm-hmm. they're made into hamburger. Um, uh, look, nature is not pretty. If, if a, a pack of coyotes gets a hold of a deer, it's not like they, you know, dispatch it quickly. They, they, they track it down, exhaust the animal, and then tear it apart. Hmm. Uh, nature is not kind. So this idea that hunting hunting is no more cruel than, than nature is. And most hunters don't want to wound an animal. Most, most, by majority, most hunters try to get as ethical a kill as possible. Uh, for, for several reasons. One, you, you don't really want to hurt an animal. Two, the, the meat is better if they don't have a bunch of adrenaline running through them and, and they're trying, trying to get away. And three, it's a hum, humongous pain in the butt to get out of your stand and then start tracking an animal for, for three miles while it looks for a thicket to die in. So I, I would guess it's less about wounded animals and people walking through their backyards and more about not liking hunting in general. Well, it is Marietta after all. Yeah. What, what are the, I don't know what, what you expect to happen if, if, if we don't keep the deer, deer population under control. I, I don't, I don't understand the logic behind, behind being totally anti hunting. And I'm not a big hunter. I haven't, I haven't gone in the woods looking for deer in uh, 15, 20 years. Um, because it's just just not my thing. It's not that I have a problem with with hunting. It just you know it's just not my thing. So anyway, that's city of Marietta. They tabled it. Good. Hopefully they just drop it. So the FTC is looking into broken ice cream machines at McDonald's. <sighs> <sighs> so there was a debate about this on on my blog page when I shared the story and. Someone said that the machines, I guess, are crafted. Basically, like the FTC is going to look into whether or not these machines are crafted so that they have to be repaired like more often than they are, and because it has to go through McDonald's or through the actual company, and that they're um, they're extremely hard to even just like do the cleaning cycle that it fails, and they have to be done. It has to be done every night, and then the machines have to be serviced by technicians, and it's just this constant cost and problem um 
which is similar. I think we talked about it. Hey, gosh, it had to be at least two two years ago at this point, maybe three. But the right to repair legislation in Georgia, like it's similar to that with like John Deere and some things where um, like it can no parts or service can be done by um, another company. And so basically these companies are about to get their ass whooped like my dogs. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you get into a franchise, you, you, you really give up the right to do anything uh, on your own. You can't buy your own napkins. You have to buy from the company. Uh, you know, <clears throat> so you, you can't go out and find your own ice cream machine. It has to be the one that McDonald's author, authorizes you to buy from, or ultimately they sell you. Uh, it, it's a, it's an interesting case. I mean, I, not being somebody who frequents McDonald's and I certainly don't get ice cream at McDonald's, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a running joke online about the broken ice cream machine because yeah, they're always broken. They are. And it seems like, so, oh, so when I was talking about the argument on my Facebook page, someone was like, well, this sounds like an issue that McDonald's should handle and investigate. And then someone was like, well, yeah, but the whole, like, they're se- if they're setting it up to to be difficult to repair and they're not, they're not allowing the restaurant employees and stuff to work on it, well, I kind of still default to it being on McDonald's, like, buy different machines. Yeah, and... I've I have been into a McDonald's and I haven't seen anybody that I really want working on anything mechanical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I don't think that them not being allowed to work on it is a function of it being I, I I don't know overly difficult, but that you're not dropping fries because you have a whole lot of mechanical aptitude. Uh, and it it may come down to to maintenance. I mean if, if they're not being cleaned properly, if they're not whatever, whatever it is. But yeah, if it's, it's, well, it's all McDonald's. They, they can buy whatever machines they want. They're a private business. They can buy whatever machines they want. And to your point, I understand that. I, I agree with you that, you know, the mechanical expertise is probably lacking. But at the same time, I do have a hard time believing that, like, because it is widespread. I mean, it doesn't matter where, like, your chances of asking for ice cream in McDonald's and them saying, sorry, our machine is down. It's like, it's... It's, I see people posting about it all the time, but so I I don't, I think that the, like, I don't think the problem is just employee error. I think there's a, it's twofold, but I'm not sure that the FTC should be investigating. Right. That's, that's kind of where I am on it is it's detrimental to McDonald's because they're not selling ice cream. You know, they're not, they're, it's a product that obviously is profitable for them or else they wouldn't offer it. So it certainly is something that, that McDonald's should be looking into, but I, man, getting the FTC involved in it, it's just going to turn it, it's just going to be a mess. Anytime you get government involved in this stuff, it's going to be a mess. Government's getting involved. I mean, just how in the hell did it get to the FTC? It's ice cream. Well, yeah, that's something that I would like. To, I mean, I guess m- maybe McDonald's lobbied for them, but I would love to know how they decided that they were going to investigate. Like, that's a pretty big deal. I've never had the FTC offer to investigate anything where I feel like I've been wronged. Yeah, the, the ice machine at your gas station. Okay, first of all, that was not me. I was the whistleblower <laughs> about the chick who lost her cool on the icy machine man, Steve. And I'll have you know, you sit there and mock me, but I saved Steve's job. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> His wife sent me a message because I put it on Facebook. She, her husband didn't get fired because that girl called and complained about him. Like he broke the machine on purpose. Give me a break. <sighs> Freaking he, people. he broke the machine on purpose. Yeah. Icy man Steve. Yeah, Steve. Parker's, right? Parker's. Right, yeah. I actually saw when uh, Matt and I had to run down to Savannah for something. I uh, actually saw Parker said, man, we got to stop and get an IC or something. Yeah. <laughs> get a picture and honor. send it to Jessica. Yes, I am a huge... Listen, this is off topic, but it's important. 
if if you have to travel south of Dublin, you and you need gas or you need water or you need a snack, you need to stop at Parker's. It is safe. They're well lit. They are almost always fully stocked. That is the only time I've seen the icy machine be down. Although Eric will, before he corrects me, he did run into a broken machine. But in all these years, that's two machines. And I'll say this: there's another, there's a mach- uh, another gas station like up by the interstate, and. I was there one day pumping gas because I thought that it would be like saving time, not going out of my way to find a Parker's. And there was a fight in the middle of the day and the cops, I didn't call the cops, but the cops had to come. And I was like in the middle of like this shouting match and everything that doesn't happen at Parker's. I'm just telling you, if you, if you have to go anywhere between Dublin and Savannah or Brunswick, I think they go all the way to Brunswick, but you want to stop at Parker's. And if you go to the one where they have cookies that they make, eat those you need to get the cookies. <laughs> what do you want, a cookie? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, there you go. New sponsor for the show. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome, Greg Parker. <laughs> uh, and I, I do like your, your last thing on the story, McBroken. That's an actual website where you can find the McBroken... Make ice creams. I mean, that shows you how big of a problem it is. Like, you can go to the site at any given day and track where the machines are currently out. A national website. Yeah, I mean, it, look, it sucks to be a franchisee, I think. Because uh, you can't shop it out to go find a different... Because it's just soft serve. I mean, there's got to be a hundred different companies that make soft serve machines. But the the franchisee can cannot can't go shop that out. He has to buy from McDonald's. Has to get the machine that they tell him to buy well, at think their price. How frustrating that would be right now, given the slowdowns in production, the slowdown in repairs, the lack of you know personnel for some of these companies. Like it could be weeks for you to have a repair done. But you go to Chick Fil A right now and, and get get ice cream. It's called an ice dream. A, it's because ice it, dream. It's freaking amazing. Or Dairy Queen. Can you imagine Dairy Queen having their ice cream machines down? Whoo! Well, I mean, they kind of just have to close their doors. Or yeah, even I mean, get a banana split. Ew. <laughs> Ew. Ew. You're so judgmental. Yeah, I am. Banana splits are weird. <laughs> Who said I'm going to cut open a banana, which like is not supposed to be split? And I'm going to put three different flavor ice creams across it. That's weird. <laughs> I don't think I don't it's eat has... a lot of sweets anyway, but I have had a banana split before. I mean, it wasn't bad. It's, no. I'm just no. wrong. Huh? It's just wrong. Yeah. Do you do you like uh, cut bananas in ice cream? I mean, I don't seek them out. No. But like you don't when... spit them out either. When I go to, when I go to the ice cream like the the place where you can pick like you know fifteen different soft serves and then you can put your own toppings and stuff on it, I've never added fruit. Banana Not even spo- cherry. Okay, well I don't think maraschino <laughs> cherries are fruit. They started off as fruit. They did, yeah, yeah. I, like if it's also sometimes soaked in vodka, I don't think it's. <laughs> it's fruit. Second, <laughs> when I fill my ice cream, like the only thing I'm I'm going to add like 3 gummy bears and then I'm going to add like a pound of rainbow sprinkles because I'm still 7. <laughs> Evidently. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, this is a good time to remind you that these are our opinions, especially the sprinkles thing, and not those of anyone not on the show, any respective company for which we may work own or otherwise associate ourselves with on a regular or irregular basis. You can also find other episodes and relevant stories over the georgiavirtue.com. Yeah, no one at the Georgia Virtue eats banana splits, I can tell you that much. I bet you Stanley would. Stanley would eat anything. <laughs> I hold a leaf so, and he takes it and he just eats it like, oh, okay, sure. Anyway. Easy to please. Yeah. Howard Bailey spent years serving his country, supporting his family, and running two small businesses. Then he got kicked out of the country. 
Yeah, this is uh, one of those stories in, that, like, the more you learn, like, the more you read, the worse it gets. Yeah, it, Howard Bailey came to the United States from Jamaica when he was 17. He, ne- he served nearly four years in the Navy right out of high school, completing two tours in Operation Desert Storm, uh, uh, earning the National Service Defense Medal, which everybody gets. Uh, <clears throat> but when it came time for Bailey, a lawful permanent resident, to apply for citizenship, his application was denied over a one-time marijuana offense. Mm-hmm. So we have a timeline here. In 2005, he disclosed the marijuana charge uh, from one decade prior. Now, the marijuana charge, uh, he received a package for his neighbor, apparently, is his story. And he, the neighbor asked him to drop it off somewhere. So he threw it in the car. So I'll, I'll drop it off for you. It turns out uh, the cops were tracking this package. He was getting popped from California. And the guy gets popped with it. His his lawyers convince him to take a plea. Said so just just be easier, take the charge. So he went went to jail, uh, took the plea. Which but he only went to like a a detention facility. He didn't go to prison yeah, like a, and serve hard like time. a work camp, right? Yeah. So he did his time. Comes back. Comes back to his wife and kids. Pay attention to the timeline though, because like there's a long time in between all this. Right. So, yeah, you're talking about 1995 when he gets popped with with weed. And then he filled uh, out his application to apply for citizenship in 2005. A decade later. Uh, in 2010, this is five years after he he, uh, uh, he disclosed it, his application was denied. His situation got worse. He woke up on June 10th, 2010 to knocks on the door of Immigration Customs Enforcement agents. Okay, the next part really pisses me off. Uh. And the the story's on reason. Uh, it's the the quote from the from the ICE agents was bad. You're like you're you're out of here, basically. Yeah, uh, but they, he wasn't out of there because he spent two years in the yeah, detention from center. 2010 to 2012 spent in ICE detention center. Why he didn't do a, he didn't commit a crime. He served time for his crime, and then he tried to go le- lawfully through the process. Right. To, to 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 join a country that he served. Uh, in 2017, uh, the Virginia governor pardoned Bailey. Uh, it took four more years for him to testify before the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, Garner letter from Senator Alex Padilla uh, from California to the Department of Homeland Security for his immigration proceedings to be reopened. He received a humanitarian parole and was allowed to return. He came home last week for the first time in a decade. He was he was shipped off to Jamaica, a country he hadn't lived in since he was seventeen, and he's forty one. Yeah, had to live with like distant cousins that he really didn't know. I mean, he they they, they dropped him in a country he didn't know. He, Do you he, this chat so much because how many times have you heard people who? And uh, listen, I'm not like I'm not for open borders or just a, a free for all um, immigration policy. But how many times have you heard people say, you know, if someone wants to come here, I think they should have to serve in the military first. OK, well, he did. <laughs> and well, then he I, had I, a pot charge. Just- he got really bad advice from his from his attorney. I assume it, it, this was a public uh, defender public defender or cut rate attorney just wanted the case off his desk. Really bad advice. Because if he's, if, if what he says is true, that's something you could argue, argue in front of a jury. I didn't know what was in it. I, someone asked me to pick up the package. But let's just say he did know what was in it. Let's just say he's guilty of sin and the plea was not, I mean, it doesn't, would I prefer that someone who came here and wanted to serve four years and then spent the next 15 years until the government ruined his life working and paying taxes and being a productive member of society? Would I prefer, and, but he has a, a, a felony weed charge under his belt. Would I prefer him over somebody who harms children or who does nothing, who has no criminal background check and just collects on the government dime? Yeah, and when when he got out of got out of the work camp, he he built up a, a nice little life. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he operated a couple businesses. Uh, 
a productive a member of society. House, wife, kids. You know, when he was deported, he left a wife and kids in the States. Kids that, that watched their dad be handcuffed and, and drug off by ICE agents. For what? And to serve in a, in a, a detention center for two years? That is, I don't understand that at all. Yeah. Because, like, how are you here illegally either at that point? Like, so if the argument is you have to be in a detention center, I mean, I know that's like the point where they transfer you back to where you're going. But please tell me if he didn't, if he served time for his time already and was in the detention, the work camp, and then he applied lawfully, but he was denied. And then I'm sure he was trying to appeal it and go through that process. Please tell me, like, what he, he has done illegally and warrants two years in a detention center in yeah, the Yeah, with no charge. Right. With no That's charge. Disgusting. This is not somebody who snuck across the border. He immigrated completely legally, uh, assuming with, with his parents when he was 17, uh, as a green card holder, joined the Navy, served four years, got popped for something stupid. And it, look, at no point should a pot charge land you in a, in a work camp. You know, that, that, that's, that's, that's a point to, uh, aside, but apparently Virginia at the time in the 90s had very draconian weed laws. Well, and also I'm sure because it came in the mail, they did the yeah. whole, you know. Yeah, in, uh, interstate and, and mm-hmm. all that stuff, yeah. Traffic. Um, traffic, yeah. So, so they really hung this guy out to dry. Uh, initially with with the charges and then had a had poor representation but all that aside had he not applied for citizenship he would still be a green card holder and none of this would have happened but and, it, and he, exactly and if he hadn't been honest you're telling me that they run they run a background check on everybody they say they right. do but they don't because people slip through all the time and they're like dangerous dangerous individuals so he was honest and look what it, where it got him yeah, they didn't deport him at, when when he was convicted. They didn't refer the case to ICE in 1995. They let him serve his time and let him get on get on with his life, be a productive member of society. Do you know how many people we have deported in from from 2003 to 2018? How many people do you think the United States has deported for marijuana possession? Well, according according to the outline, it's 45,000 people. That is insane to me. And and what's crazy is that in a lot of the situations, it, it, I don't think it was, well, it certainly wasn't in this case, but in, in a lot of the situations more recently, it's in states where marijuana is legal. Now, right. whatever your position is, um, I, I, I mean, yes, you can totally make the argument, well, if somebody is... Um, you know, trying to get through the citizenship process, they should mind their P's and Q's and all this. Yes, I agree. I really do. But in the scheme of the type of people that we are trying to keep out of this country versus the type of people who are, I mean, look at the big picture here. Right. Look, and of course, 45,000 people being deported, there, there there's... Tons of different things that, that, you know, different cases that, that are in it. But for marijuana possession, that's absurd. It's absurd. I mean, I understand it's a controlled substance, especially, you know, in Georgia, if you get, if you get popped with, even with a, with a joint in your pocket, uh, it's illegal. You're breaking the law. But to deport otherwise uh, productive members of society and green card holders over a pot charge is just stupid. It it's is. just stupid. It's it's absurd. It's it's obtuse. You know. And it I guarantee you it wasn't cheap. We paid for him to live for two years in a detention facility. Right. Away from his wife and kids and then sent him to a country he didn't know. So I mean just just alone on um like just while he was in that facility, if it was fifty dollars a day to take care of him, that's thirty six thousand dollars we paid. And you know it's more than that. Of course. And you know it's more than that. It's it. 
the food probably was 50 bucks a day, not, not including the, the electric bill to keep the lights on in a cell, the guards to, to, to keep them there. Well, it depends else if it was to, private or not, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, just a, it's just a horrible story. Hey, look, the, the, the veteran status on it is, is I don't even care. Uh, you know, you don't get special treatment just just for being a veteran. I, I just I don't care about that aspect of it. It just makes the story more horrible to say that you know he loved this country so much that he decided to serve it. But the the treatment of anybody like this, and again, it, had he not been the nail that st- stuck up applying for for citizenship, he wouldn't have gotten hammered down. He would have well, continued to have have his green card, and he could have lived the rest of his life, and nobody would look look twice at him. You're right, and and I'm not saying that he should been treated differently as a veteran and I don't I'm not sure that the story is either but like I said I I can't I can't even count the number of times I've heard somebody say if someone wants to come here I think they should serve in our military and you're telling me that four years of military service no matter you know where it was or what he did that that is less valuable and and is of no value to us because he accepted a package full of marijuana Really? Give me a break. It's pot. We're not we're not talking about crystal meth. Hey, even if you are, I mean it's your own your own choice if you want your damn teeth to fall out of your head. Um but it's it's just it's just so obtuse uh, to say, well, you broke the law, that's it. And again, had he, he was he was he loved this country so much, he decided to serve it when he was 18 years old. He loved this country so much, he decided he wanted to be a citizen. Uh, he loved this country so much that uh, he, after he got out of jail, he didn't pack his family up and move, move back to Jamaica. No, he made a life here. A productive he made a life. life. For him, a productive life for him and his wife and his children. That he put, he put that behind him. He did exactly what we want to people to do when they come out of jail they say well i won't do that again and he says he's never smoked pot and, and i don't know if that's it, it, whatever but he says he's, he's not a marijuana user he's never smoked pot he didn't know it was in the package all this stuff should have been come, come, coming out at trial but he he got hosed by the system and i guarantee you in 1995 when he was when he was a young man he didn't have the money to to hire somebody you know he, he couldn't call Catherine bernard and have her put her cape on and fly in and, and help him. Uh, that stuff just wasn't happening in 95. You know, we you, we weren't getting jury nullification. And, you know, it, it is also a statement of how our society has has come around in, you know, in the 25 years since that happened. That, you know, juries now just don't care. You, right. got, you, you know, you get a pot charge and you get 12 people say a jury going, so what else? That's it? Nah. And that's that's what makes what the work that that you know who somebody had been on the show before I before I, I came on with Catherine Bernard is an awesome attorney got a straight up jury nullification on a pot charge. I mean that not not a mistrial not a straight up jury nullification. It brilliant, brilliant attorney. If if I ever got caught holding, that's who I'm calling. Either that or David Ralston, so I never have to go to trial. <laughs> The weekly dig at Ralston. Yes. So Jessica, do you have any closing thoughts as we start winding down the clock? Um, no. I've actually got a couple. Uh, one, uh, Neil Wolin, the, the, the person who uh, who announced he was running against Martin Momtahan, Uh, you know he he. He started. He started the whole thing. I talked about it a couple of weeks ago about uh, why Martin hasn't said anything about Afghanistan. It's because you know he's from Iran and all this stuff, and he's not. He's from you know he's from Paulding County. You can tell by talking to him. Uh, so research dug up like racist rants when he was in college. I mean, on either the Facebook or Twitter, like his name's on it, and you and you, he's going back and forth with this guy, and and I mean, it, it is. Bad. It's it's on it's on Martin's page. It's bad. I mean, it's like it's not it's not funny. Ha ha. Made a joke. It is like you're like pointing his finger. Like you've got to be on welfare. I mean, just bad. Uh, so <laughs> Martin dropped that bomb, and you know this guy never had a job, like a real job, out of college. 
He like went. He, he's worked for lobbyists and like G, uh, Georgia gun owners stuff like that. He's never like according to his LinkedIn. You looked at it, like he's never like worked for anything. So and of course he's he's lived in district for a few months before he before he announced that he was running. So I uh, I think that guy's done. He should probably just go ahead and announce that he's going to work on himself. And uh, he's not going to run seek office right now because what he's going to do is he's is he's just going to scorch the earth where he's so radioactive that he'll never be able to to, to obtain office. And and look, I I don't really like people that their only goal in life is to get elected. Mm-hmm. Like th- this is what he wanted coming coming out of school. So anyway, the the last thought is there's a, a video on my uh, on my Facebook. Uh, this little girl last year during the pandemic challenged Dave Grohl of the Foo Fighters to a drum off. Uh, Dave Grohl was the drummer for Nirvana. And this little girl, she's 11 now. This little girl can play. I mean, she's got a great meter. Uh, she was playing to a Foo Fighters song and played it well. And I thought it was really cool that Grohl went back and forth with her on YouTube videos. Like he'd play and challenge her and they'd go back and forth. Well, in a concert last week, or I guess now as the show drops two weeks ago, he brings her on stage. Oh my god! And and introduces her, and they bring her trap out, and the Foo Fighters drummer doesn't play. He he sits down. I think he's got got a son in his lap, just watching this little girl play. And they play Everlong together. And this, I mean, you're talking about an 11 year old little girl gets down, buddy. And she's playing with bona fide rock stars, and the moment's not too big for her. She's tossing drumsticks, she's twirling sticks, she's doing everything that you know a drummer that's been doing it for twenty years does. And it was just absolutely touching, awesome video. Uh, I don't know if I want my eleven year old hanging out with Dave Grohl, <laughs> especially with you know the language they uses on stage and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, I'm, Dave Grohl's a huge advocate for passing music on to the next generation and real music and real recording studios and things like that. And he does a really good job on it. It's just, it's just an awesome, awesome video. And maybe we'll share it on, on the page with a not safe for work language warning on it, but it's just an awesome, awesome video. So anyway, for Jessica Salaji, my partner in crime for Eric Cumbie, our awesome editor, I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week. 